Okay, okay. How many times have you seen this exact scenario? It is the last remaining part of the story, and after countless battles, defeats, and victories, we finally enter the final confrontation against the main antagonist. The protagonists have grown immensely compared to where they started out, representing a level of strength that stands at the pinnacle of their verse. However, despite all their effort, all their hard work, and all their training, compared to the main antagonist, every other character is nothing. Perhaps they hold godlike physical abilities, capable of blitzing or crushing every other character in the series, or wiping away mountains in the blink of an eye, or moving faster than light itself. Or perhaps they simply hold an ability so absolutely all-encompassing that ignores any forms of defense or counters the protagonist may mount against it. Regardless of the reason, the antagonist is, put briefly, undefeatable. This type of main antagonist tends to pop up mostly in shonen stories. It's harder to find a series with a reasonable final antagonist than it is to find one whose power is simply off the rails and completely unstoppable. And almost always, this leads to the author running into the dilemma of how you're meant to defeat someone like that. Most of the time, all the time, the solution is unsatisfying and undeserved. The protagonist may find some plot device capable of rendering their powers completely null and void, or they may undergo a power-up through some outside or internal force that suddenly allows them to match up or even effortlessly dispatch the antagonist. This typically leads to a conclusion that betrays both the narrative significance of the villain as well as destroying any stakes the story had. Is it really that difficult to write a main antagonist who, while powerful, is still within a reasonable realm of strength that doesn't require protagonists to pull things out of nowhere to defeat? Why are shonen villains always so incredibly overpowered? Like, what are the reasons for this? Let's first run through a few examples of this point. Madara Uchiha is one of the most prime examples of an overpowered antagonist. Foreshadowed hundreds of chapters in advance, the general understanding of Madara for most of the series was that he was a character of incredible strength, influence, and ability. However, it would only be at his introduction that we would truly understand how powerful he was. Beginning by taking on an entire army by himself, but it wasn't until he dropped that meteor that the audience understood the sheer difference in the magnitude of power displayed here. There are levels to this, and the second meteor really hammered in that point. After this, Madara continues to show feat after feat, splitting apart mountain ranges with the swing of his blade, soloing all five Kage, who are meant to be the highest ranking officials from every nation in the world, and then taming the literal weapons of mass destructions given life that are the tilled beasts. But here's the thing with overpowered antagonists in Shonen, for some reason. Despite the fact that they start strong enough to solo the entire verse, the author decides, hmm, not strong enough, and then continues to give them buff after transformation after buff. Thus, Madara became fully revived, gained the Ten Tails, then both Rinnegan, until finally reaching his final stage of awakening by getting the Rinne Sharingan. To put Madara's abilities into perspective at this point, he held illusionary techniques capable of hypnotizing the entire world at once, regeneration strong enough to grow back half of his torso, the ability to spawn rains of meteors from the sky, and the ability to command invisible clones of himself as strong as he was from a separate dimension. So of course, he literally succeeds in his plan, killing both main characters before placing the entire world in a never-ending dream of happiness. Then how do you go about resolving such an immensely powerful threat? You guessed right, plot contrivance. Ah, you're going to be seeing a lot of this. Literally stabbed in the back by God herself, Madara is then absorbed with the revelation that actually, someone else was pulling the strings the entire time. This is, without a doubt, the worst plot twist within the entire series, as you'd struggle to find a single person who claims to like Kaguya as a final antagonist more than Madara. And while I wish I could tell you that this is the only time the issue of plot contrivance comes up, when dealing with final antagonists, it is often the rule, not the exception. Another popular overpowered antagonist is that of Sosuke Aizen, the shocking twist villain of Bleach's first core. Aizen's twist reveal was honestly pretty well executed, making the Soul Society arc one of the most engaging to read within the entire series. However, it wouldn't be until much later that we understood the depths of his power. 
Starting off in the series, while Aizen was exceptionally powerful, he wasn't yet capable of wiping out all his opposition by himself. Thus, he gathered a force for the protagonist's defeat, growing stronger with each battle, leading to the final confrontation against him in fake Karakura Town. Aizen finally reveals himself with the bulk of his remaining forces, hoping to confront and finally crush the Gotei 13. While at first it appears that he brought the others along due to requiring backup, this notion is quickly pushed to the side as he finishes off the remaining Gotei 13 members all by himself. This is due to Aizen's biggest trump card. Besides his exceptional physical ability and master of the Kido arts, he also has his sword release, Perfect Hypnosis. As the name implies, Aizen is capable of hypnotizing anyone who sees him release his blade's ability, though of course, in order to face him, Ichigo, our protagonist, is the only one who has not met this requirement and thus is the only one who stands a chance against him. While a daunting challenge, at this point it doesn't exactly seem hopeless. There's still a good chance of defeating him, through raw efforts and cooperation alone. Now let me introduce you to the Hyogoku. This little thing in Aizen's chest grants him functional immortality. Not in the boring, I can't be killed kind of way, but in the, not only can I not be killed, I will also adapt to any situation and overcome it kind of way. And thus, as the arc progresses, Aizen's power rapidly develops to the point of literally recovering from an attack meant to atomize him. In order to combat such an overwhelming challenge, Ichigo gains an ability finally capable of putting Aizen down. The final Getsuga Tensho. It stands a chance of defeating Aizen, yes, but at the price of all the abilities Ichigo has gained thus far into the story. And I really like this and what it represents. The ultimate sacrifice in order to finally climb over that insurmountable obstacle, even if it means throwing away everything that makes you who you are. And then he just gets back up. What? Oh, Aizen is sealed soon after. But the fact that the main protagonist literally throwing away all of their potential and powers to defeat them didn't get the job done really shows you how powerful Aizen was. Regardless, his conclusion as a villain at least meets a satisfying end. The same cannot be said about Yuha. Manga spoilers ahead, so just skip on over to this time if you don't want to hear them. Yuha appears as the main villain of the final part of Bleach, sealing off the ultimate confrontation of the blood warfare. Despite throwing hands with Ichigo, we don't get a true indication of his strength until his battle against Ichibe, where he finally begins revealing his horribly overpowered abilities. Yuha is capable of seeing into the future. That alone is pretty good. Foresight's a great ability, but the Almighty allows for more than this. Yuha can shape the future to be however he wants, as in full reality manipulation. Any ability he views in the future will not work against him, and he's capable of eliminating a threat before it even gets the chance to meet his body. So how do the protagonists even beat this? In the final fight between Ichigo and Yuha, Ichigo displays the true final state of his blade, something that has been set up for the entirety of the series, and Yuha responds by immediately destroying it. You were listening when I described this guy's ability set, right? As the fight continues, Ichigo's sword is restored once again in a climactic struggle to finally defeat this threat. Everything seems hopeless, as Yuha displays himself to also be functionally immortal, when suddenly, an arrow flies into his back, taking away all of his powers for a brief moment. This is the Deuce Ex Machina- uh, uh, sorry, I mean the Still Silver, which totally was built up and not just brought into the plot to defeat him. Yeah, that's how it ends. Ichigo lands the final blow and Yuha is defeated once and for all. This is a conclusion that pops up in Shonen Raider's Nightmares and is easily one of the least satisfying conclusions of a final villain that has ever occurred. Definitely the worst case of plot contrivance I can think of as the deus ex machina here is so blatant that it just takes away everything Yuha was built up to be. Now to be honest with you, I haven't actually watched One Piece. Though it seems that the closest thing the series has gotten to the overpowered villain archetype is with Kaido, King of the Beast Pirates. I've heard complaints that the fights with him are drawn out and that he was unreasonably strong when introduced. However, as someone who hasn't watched the show, I can't give an honest opinion. And that's where you One Piece fans come in. Scroll on down to the comments section and leave your opinion on how you think Kaido was handled. Was the build up to him done properly? Was his eventual downfall a satisfying conclusion to his character? You tell me. 
With that done, let's move on to the latest overpowered villain in the shonen space. Sukuna has been a prevailing character since the very beginning of Jujutsu Kaisen. I mean, the very first chapter of the entire series is named after him. In every one of his appearances, there's only one thing the audience needs to understand. This guy is ridiculously strong. From essentially one-shotting special grade curses, to touring around with major antagonists of arcs, Sukuna's sheer power was displayed to be limitless. So, Jujutsu Kaisen manga spoilers are ahead by the way, now that it's time for Sukuna to step up as a proper final antagonist, the fight against him rages on and there's only one general conception admits the community's mind. How the hell are we meant to beat this? Don't get me wrong, when this Shinjuku Shodan arc first began, things seemed somewhat hopeful. There was Gojo, the overpowered mentor who was literally untouchable, Kiguruma with his one shot one kill blade, and Yuta and Maki were considerable fighters in their own right. However, as the fight rages on, the main protagonist options continue to dwindle more and more as Sukuna piles up a mountain of bodies. And now we're at the point in the story where literal side antagonists who have only appeared in the movie are being called in to fight against him. I don't really know what the plan is at this point. My only guess is that Megami eventually locks in and Yuji reaches him again, though as Sukuna continues to land black flashes and undo all the work Gojo, Yuta and Yuji did in lowering his output, it's not really looking good. I guess not knowing how the story is going to turn out is a good thing in of itself if you think about it in that way. So why are final antagonists always so horribly overpowered? Well one of the more likely reasons is due to the author's inability to plan ahead, writing themselves into a wall due to power creep. This is the final villain of the entire series, so it's almost a requirement that they be stronger than every single character that came before, due to shonen rules. This leads to them, in most scenarios, having abilities so incredibly strong that the only solution to dealing with them is either through plot contrivance like sudden burst in power, or a plot device that just happens to appear where the protagonists need it. Hirohiko Araki has said the reason he gives his antagonist time-based powers is because those are the strongest abilities he can imagine. So his villains get ludicrous abilities such as stopping or erasing time, and the only way they can be dealt with is through suddenly gaining the power to stop time yourself or winning over the plot device Arrow. Not that I don't like the endings to part 3 or 5, but you can see the problems such strong villains create. Though while author oversight might be a large reason, there's an even bigger, more general one. And that is, what the author is trying to make the main antagonist represent. That is an insurmountable, unstoppable obstacle that it seems our main protagonists have absolutely no way to defeat, conveying this feeling to the audience as well. So they'll stack crazy ability after crazy ability, all in hopes that the main villain seems like an unstoppable force. But of course, this is shonen, so the main protagonist will triumph in the end. Maybe through horrible sacrifice, maybe by coming to terms with a part of themselves, but in the end, they will win. Because that's the point. These people are our heroes, and when faced against impossible circumstances, they climb straight past it with unstoppable wills and determinations. Equally, that's why these are our antagonists. They represent that final impossible challenge. But the point is, it isn't impossible. With enough hard work, support from friends and sheer human determination, any obstacle can be conquered. That is the beauty in the challenge. That is the point of the final impossible antagonist. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed the experience, be sure to leave a like down below as your feedback is greatly appreciated. I'm thinking of making a series similar to this and why do protagonists always get boring powers, so if you want to see more, feel free to subscribe. Anyway, I'll be leaving it here. Thank you for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.